I'm so excited to share this research and the application of educational neuroscience. I am Lori Desitel, and I am an assistant professor um, in the College of Education at Butler University. And this morning, I'm going to be sharing just a snapshot of what the application of educational neuroscience is looking like in K or pre-K through 12 classrooms, schools, and districts. So as I begin this morning, I want to share that this neuroscience in its application inside of education is new and emerging and um, it's exciting because it is a framework, it is not a program, and so it can be built into and implemented into everything we all do already as teachers, as administrators, as instructional assistants. And I wanna also say that this framework is for all students. Um, as we look at the MTSS uh, template and we think about tier one and tier two and tier three strategies, it's gonna be very important to understand that the strategies that I will briefly explain this morning um, are, again, are good for all students. But as we move into tier two and tier three, then we begin to maybe use some of these strategies a little more frequently in small groups. Um, we amp up maybe a little bit of the intensity, depending on the brain state that the child or the adolescent is walking into our classrooms or carrying in. So to begin with, this framework stands on four legs, just like a nice sturdy coffee table. Those four legs for me have an order of priority. And the very first leg is my brain state. I cannot emphasize this enough. Educator brain state is all about discipline. Educator brain state, how we are coming into our classrooms, our moods, our feelings, the way that we are sensing the environment as we interface with children and adolescents is extremely important. And the work and the vocation of education is an organic living system, and it's a hard, hard vocation. So I want to emphasize some of the things that we are implementing into the schools and districts around the state and around the country. And I'm really, really excited to share that um, one of the large districts here in Indiana is looking at um, putting in or implementing neuro centers into schools for teacher and educator well-being. So this is really exciting and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the very first leg of this is teacher educator brain state. The second leg of this framework is regulation. And when we talk about regulation, it's kind of becoming a buzzword, but I want to describe it in a way where the brain and the body feel calm. We are in a state of relaxed alertness. And this is really the best way to socialize, the best brain state for learning. And so I wanna add a prefix to regulation and that is co-regulation because within this framework, this is relational discipline. And so the application of these strategies and these four legs are about a new lens, a brain aligned lens for discipline. The third leg of this work um, or this framework is connection and attachment. We are calling deepening connections and deepening attachments touch points in the classroom because many of our children and adolescents walk in with fewer and fewer face-to-face, -face, um, really emotionally available conversations with um, a caregiver who is emotionally attuned and, and that really affects the lack of attachment, secure attachment, really affects cognition and it affects behavior and it affects brain development and also the way our stress response systems uh, reprogram. So looking at those as touch points, those three legs are followed by teaching staff and students together about their neuroanatomy. And this is really exciting because we are really putting the science beneath the behaviors. 
we now understand that it is so much more efficient and effective to ask not what is wrong with the student, but what happened to the student. Because we are learning with the research in neuroscience and attachment that adversity and trauma absolutely um, diminish and affect brain architecture. And when I say diminish brain architecture, we understand that that brain begins developing in utero and it develops through oftentimes late 20s and early 30s. And when a child or an adolescent is faced with significant adversity or trauma, certain areas in the brain are affected Therefore, learning and behaviors are affected. The adversities and the trauma that I'm referring to this morning um, are just almost more than we can count. The original Adverse Childhood Experience study was conducted in the mid-1990s. Since that time, another larger, more diverse study was um, collected and um, the data was processed in 2017, 2018. And this was from 249,000 participants over 23 states. And it was, again, a much more diverse adverse childhood experience study. And so I want to share a little bit this morning um, in that our children and adolescents, first of all, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, are very common. We all carry ACEs, every single one of us. But what we understand is that a child or an adolescent who grows up in poverty, who grows up with, um, in, an, in an environment where there was a significant separation or divorce, where there was neglect or social, um, continuous social rejection, where there was domestic violence, um, where there was uh, someone who they cared for who was incarcerated, um, looking at sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Also, we have many of our children and adolescents walking into our classrooms who are what we call young carers. They have responsibilities they should never have at the ages that they have them. And so this can also be an adversity. Um, we know that growing up in an environment where there's been alcoholism or addiction or mental illness um, is also an adversity. Losing a caregiver or losing someone that you are close to um, is also an adversity. And in the new ACE study, we also see the vulnerability of the multiracial population as an adversity, the, the vulnerability of the LGBTQ population as an adversity, and also how is social media and technology affecting our children and adolescents, especially when it comes from um, lacking those face-to-face -face, uh, touch points that really drive and enhance the way the brain develops. So when we think about these vulnerabilities and we think about adversities and trauma, the research is sharing with us right now that children and adolescents who walk in with four or more adverse childhood experiences are 32.6 times more likely to have academic and behavioral challenges. And for me as an educator, this is so significant to understand because when a child is carrying in those adversities, they are walking into school in a survival brain state. And in a survival brain state, that brain is completely unable to process cognition. That brain is not able to problem solve, to think through consequences, to emotionally regulate, to have strong working memory and sustained attention, to be uh, transitional and to be um, creative. So academically, when we think about the application of educational neuroscience, what we need to think about is how many of these adversity gaps that we are seeing are achievement gaps or are these achievement gaps adversity gaps? Because when children are growing up with this survival brain state, that brain is locked up in what we call a fight flight response, meaning that the brain develops from the very back to the front and from the inside out. So the brain stem is the seat of sensations. 
It's also the seat of where we are, our, our bodies and brains do everything automatically. So that's where we have respiration and breathing. And it's where the sensory systems come in and we need to co-regulate those. And if that child or if that baby did not have an emotionally available, consistent, um, um, attuned caregiver during those early years, then that child is unable at five years old, at eight years old, at 12 years, 12 years of age to regulate his or her stress response system. And most, if not all, chronic behavioral issues are regulation issues which are physiological issues. So when we use traditional punishment with children who come in with toxic levels of stress, we are unintentionally reactivating their stress response systems and re-traumatizing them. And so I'm gonna talk about this relational discipline piece, but to understand that the brain develops in the first 1,000 days of life from utero through age two, the brain is the stickiest. Experiences are what build build brain architecture. So they could be toxic experiences, they could be nurturing experiences. So what we understand is that that brain, went in that first 1,000 days of life, those experiences are held implicitly. They are held through um, visual images and oftentimes not remembered at 10 and 12. But we can become triggered. We can see um, a sight or smell something or we can just absolutely um, you know, become disrupt disruptive or aggressive or violent and all of a sudden the teacher is wondering what just happened. So. This development in these first 1,000 days is critical. The second area of development that I know I was not prepared to understand as an educator is that between third, fourth, and fifth grade through middle school and early high school, the brain goes through its second greatest time of brain development. And those connections, those synapses that we no longer need or are using are being um, consolidated. And so there is almost like a vacancy in the brain awaiting for new experiences to build brain architecture. So what we understand is that yes, in that pre-bubescent adolescent brain, hormones matter, peers matter, but what we understand is that brain is very vulnerable as it moves through its second greatest time. So in looking at this piece of brain development and understanding the application of educational neuroscience. We know that the brain has a priority of roles and the first purpose and role of brain functioning is survival. So survival will trump an algebra problem, will trump reading Shakespeare, will trump surface area. The second role or responsibility purpose of a brain is emotion. As Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor shares with us, we are feeling creatures who think, we are not thinking creatures who feel. And the third and final role or purpose of having a brain is cognition. But in our classrooms, oftentimes, because we misunderstand the research, we meet children academically, and that's not where they are coming in or functioning. They are coming in in a brain state that is in that survival state. So we will now be talking about how we use touch points, connections, strengthening those, and sensory regulation strategies with all students, but specifically intensifying and using more frequently those strategies in our middle and top tier.